Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming again. All right. I've muted everybody from the start, so we should be okay for today. Again, thanks everybody for being here. This is week five of six. We only have one more week to go after this. Um, Kevin is coming, but he will be here a little bit later because life. So until then, there are a lot of things that I want to go through and some of the things that if I can't get through today, then we'll look at it next week because it's something that I really, really want to talk about. Um, as most of you know, or all of you know by now, my name is Aaliyah Drapes. I'm an occupational therapist. I'm the director of Opal Kids and the host for all of these sessions. Um, if you have your video on, I will just like to ask to please take it off so that we don't use up the bandwidth too much. And apart from that, if you have any questions, feel free to use that chat as we go along. Ask whatever questions you have, you know, feel free to talk and make this as interactive as possible. And again, because some of the things that we might share, especially with today and especially next week, just to keep it confidential, you know, don't go down the road and be like, hey, so-and-so say this. We just want to make sure that everybody has a safe space to be able to participate while we're here. All right. So my highlight for today is that I wanted to talk a little bit about taking time. I know in Alicia's session a few weeks ago, she spoke a lot about parents needing to make sure that you manage yourselves as well and make sure that you are taking some time to um, work on your stress levels so that you can be there for your children in the way that you want to be. And I wanted to reiterate that um, because it was something that also came up in a session that I had yesterday with parents where, you know, we were talking about it again, where as parents, you do need to make sure that you have your own time where you could de-stress and decompress and um, feel calm and get yourself in a space where you're relaxed and you could put your thoughts together so that you could handle everything else that's going on. But on the other side of that, it came up twice in the last two days and I thought it was important to bring it up with everybody. It's also taking time to taking time for your children and not just your children as a whole unit, but each individual child also needs to have alone time with with you and with you know with each parent. And that's very important. As an example, yesterday in one of the sessions, um, the dad was saying that he realized that it's actually his son who told him that you know he wasn't getting that one-on-one -on -one time with the parent with each parent because they always did things as a family which you know you would think yeah you do things as a family great but what that child wanted was to have one-on-one -on -one time with mommy to have one-on-one -on -one time with daddy just so that they could have their own bonding time and it doesn't always have to feel like every is everybody together all the time and you know everybody's a unit so sometimes it's really good for each child to have that special one-on-one -on -one time with each parent or with both parents together so that they could have that sense of them being an own individual and get their own little special time. Um, there was another instance where that came up where the importance of having that special one-on-one -on -one time um, was something that really affected the child with not being able to have it now. So as much as possible, if you have opportunities now, it might be a little bit harder to do it if everybody's in the house or if you are going back to work now and the children are at home all the time, it's a little bit harder now to carve out that time. But from yesterday, what one of the parents was saying was that he decided to start exercising with the child because it was something that was recommended anyway, but he did it in such a way where it wasn't a... Uh, a chore anymore. They did it together. And by doing the exercises together, they got the therapy part in, but then the child also had that time to bond with his dad that he really wanted and he really missed. 
So, and as I, um, as one of the parents said to me today, and I had recommended it yesterday to another parent, was even things like, if you have to go for a little drive somewhere, or a little errand, and maybe the child can stay in the car while you go and do it, or just to take a drive to go somewhere, that's something that you could have a little bonding time with, and you could do together. And but I remember when I was in college, and I never really used to live with my dad, but I lived with him for a time when um, we were both in Barbados. He was working and I was studying. And he used to drop me to to town while he would go to work in town and then I would go to school. And that little short space of time from the house to town, that was our little bonding time. And he would do things like come up with, um, with a, a thing that we would think about for the day. And it became something that we just had every day that um, that we look, I know that we both look forward to it. And it was just, you know, maybe about 20 minutes in the morning, if so much, that was a bonding time for us. But it was really important. And I mean, I was an adult at that time. So now for kids, for them to have that little, their own time is really important for them to get that nice special feeling. So that's my highlight for today. And, right, somebody saying to carry it to the park or Mario's kids section. I mean, find whatever works for you. Even if it's something that you might have to do at home, it could be watching a show together home, or it could be um, doing what I suggested yesterday was to cook it because one of the boys like cooking. So it could be something like if you're making cookies together or doing something together where it's just the two of you and any other children could, you know, they will get their time when it's their time. And well, adding on to that too, I wanna add to that for children who have siblings, having their own time with nobody around is also important for them. So especially if it might be a little bit of an older sibling, just having that time where they don't have to worry about the brother or the sister being in the room, talking to them or making noise or wanting to play or mommy and daddy coming and telling them something, just them having their own time where they could read the book, draw, color, do whatever they want is also very important. Just because they need, children need their space as much as adults need their space. So it's important to just remember about taking time for yourself with each child individually and making sure that your child also has time for him or herself away from everybody else. All right. Now the next thing I wanted to bring up is not as um, light, but it's something that is important too that I wanted to address and I also want to get your feedback on it. And I would like to talk about this for the next few minutes until Kevin comes on. And if it's something that we still want to talk about next week, then we could work on that next week too. And this is really on the topic of therapy and um, more the services for special needs in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, I know that there's a reputation of, well, it's not a great reputation of therapists and schools in general and all these special needs services. There is a reputation of um, being money hungry or it's just a business or, you know, trying to take advantage of parents and doing things that would seem like it's not in the best interest of the families and more in the interest of having business. Um, I know there have been two times in the past, about five years apart, when two people wrote different articles. One was for a newspaper and one was for a blog. And both of them basically said things like that, like, a lot of the, like, you know, the therapies, everything is expensive and it's so many thousands of dollars to get an assessment and um, all, the, all the different, with a, a lot of negative things in both articles. And when I read both of them, it hurt me a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. First reason why it hurt so much to read it was because they were very wrong 
in painting all of the therapists with the same brush and saying that if you are looking at doing therapy in Trinidad and Tobago or schools or whatever it is, this is the situation. So I felt that was very wrong, but then also hurt just as much because I know they were right. Because um, unfortunately, it's not just they did this article to put blame on somebody or to be spiteful. They did that article because it was a situation that either they were in or it's a situation that has come up so many times before. And one of the people I messaged, because I knew the person, one of the people who wrote the articles, and I messaged, and because I was surprised that this person would write this article, knowing therapists who did not fit that, that that person was writing about. So I wrote to ask, um, or just say, you know, not everybody is like that. And a lot of the therapists don't operate like that, even though, yes, I know where you're coming from. But, um, and the response that I got was very much, yes, I understand your point and I know that what you're saying is right, but just based on fact, this is, this is, these are the stories that are coming to me from parents, so I have to put it out there. And I said, okay, fair enough. And the reality is that I know a lot of therapists, all of us, not just, you know, everybody else, I am in this too. Uh, we do need to do better in making sure that the way that we operate is not on a kind of level where it's just what we say goes. And the same thing that we've been saying for the last few weeks where parents, you need to be um, the lead of the team and you need to be, um, you need to advocate for your child and all of that, is it is up to us to, to take a step back and, and really do that and allow you to be part of that team, a better part of that team. And exactly what Michelle is saying here is what I wanted to touch on where I know a lot of people don't really understand therapies in general and what it is we do on and the background to things and why it's so expensive. So I wanted to take a little bit of time to go through that and just give a little bit of background into why we do some of the things we do and so that we could get a little bit of two-way understanding. Because I, I know that I have been a recipient of many, many nasty comments and people thinking, you know, you're just doing a handwriting with my child, that's too expensive, I could get somebody to do it for $50. When, and no matter how much I try to explain that it's not just handwriting, it's a whole set of other things that go into it, it doesn't always reach that. Um, so one of the things that a lot of people want to know is why is therapy so expensive? That's the main, the main thing. And I totally agree it is expensive. It is an expensive service to have. And especially because it's not something that is available publicly, generally, most therapies are not available publicly. It, it makes it almost, um, it makes it almost like robbery to think that you have to pay for something that you need desperately. So the reason why therapy is so expensive is because all of us have, is a paramedical profession. All of most of these professions that we do is a paramedical profession. It comes under um, certain boards and certain brackets. And all of us would have had to go through many, many years of school to get where we are. And even once we finish school and we graduated, we still have to continue doing continual, um, continuing education courses. For OTs and speech in particular, we get audited every two years randomly and that means that we have to show that we are continuing with our education and taking new courses and doing things to make sure that we keep on top of things so that we can provide the best care and of course that comes with a cost especially if you have to go away and do courses and things like that um, so therapy is expensive because it is a specialized service and even if your therapist is fresh out of school, it still means that he or she has gone through many, many years 
to get to the point where they are, to be qualified enough to work with your child or to work with um, whomever they're going to work with. So that is why it is expensive. And even though there's no law that says you must charge within a certain range or you can't charge as much or you can't go that much, everybody tends to stick within the same sort of range. So, I, you know, you have... I don't think anybody is too exorbitant, but each different practice will, they have to base their costs on their costs on, you know, what they need to do. Some people have more rent to pay, they have more equipment to buy, they have, you know, assessments to buy. So all those things factor into a cost. Um, so different places you go, that's why you might get different prices. But generally everybody stays in the same range and it, it is usually along the course of maybe the course of a doctor's visit is what you will pay for a therapist. And it also depends too on um, the type of therapy that you do, the cost will vary. So that's basically why it is the cost it is. And it has to be that way for us to be able to make a living too. Because, you know, it is the career that we have when we do really do anything outside of that. In terms of the government part of it, now the advocacy part of it, I know that the OTZ speech physios, the other professionals, um, all of us, are pretty tireless in advocating for the people that need our services and to get it more readily available. And it's something that since I've been an OT, I know for, I could only speak for OTs specifically, but since I've become an occupational therapist, we've been trying to push in and get services wherever we need to go. And I see different things changing, I'm not gonna lie. You know, I see different little things happening. It might not always be the way that we think it should or the way that you know, it's supposed to be. But you see little things happening slowly and gradually. So I know that at some point, things are going to fall in place. But um, we do try tirelessly to get things in a public service way where everybody could get services. But having said that, I know that even though we kind of have it bad here, I've seen it worse in bigger countries. So when I used to work in the UK, I had a job, uh, um, a job in public service, and for my my role was basically just to go through the waiting list and clear that waiting list because they hadn't had a OT for a long while. And what happened was that I was not allowed to see children one on one. The way that we see children here, I couldn't do that. If I had to see a child one on one, I had to come up with a real good reason for needing to see this child individually. And even if I came up with the reason, it could only be for a short time. I had to do it as a block of four sessions. I don't even think I went more than four sessions. And there was one child I used to see regularly every other week for services. And the only reason that they got those services was because they took them to court to be able to have their child be seen regularly for therapy and that was actually one of the reasons why I left England to come back here it was because I didn't feel like we were able to work there it was just just ticking off waiting lists and just getting rid of waiting lists and saying well okay this is what you could do I'll see you in six months um, so in some ways I do think that we have an opportunity here maybe that maybe other places don't have and I know oh okay I'm seeing a comment here <laughs> the as of the RHA with the advertisement for speech and OT I saw it as well one of the problems with that is that the pay grade for those jobs are usually from like 1970s, 1980s kind of thing. So for somebody to take on a role like that full time, it's 
not going to be very inviting for any therapist because the salary that they're going to get is usually not enough to sustain whatever you need to do. And I mean, that's a reality. So that's, that's the problem with that one. Um, yes, true. Doctor's visits sometimes are short. You're in, you're out, you get your answers and therapy services can take a long time. Um, the, I guess the downside of that is because therapy is every week or, you know, as often as you need to, it makes it even harder. And then especially, I know there's a whole thing with insurance and insurance not covering a lot of these services or insurance kind of blankets and everybody and saying, well, OT speech fits you, everybody come on to come under one. So if they're covering 12 sessions, that's 12 sessions in total. So in a month, that's all your insurance is going to cover for the year. So that is, I mean, honestly, it's, it's, it's used with everything because there really is no, no set way of doing things because I think everybody is still so new in the game. So insurance companies don't know what occupational therapy is for the most part. So um, they might not recognize a lot of it or they might put it under psychology or not really understand the ins and outs. So there is a lot of work to be done by us therapists to let all these different companies know about what it is we do and the importance of it and the fact that it is ongoing and this is what people need to do. So there's a lot of change that needs to happen from, you know, therapists so that parents can be able to get the benefit of it and it doesn't always have to be a fight up and everything like that. But um, what I will say is that not all the therapists that I come across are going to be you know, money hungry, that kind of thing, most of the therapists you come across will not be. You know, as somebody said rightfully, most of the therapists you come across really, we care about your children and we care about you and we want to make sure that you get the most out of your services from us. And having said that, one of the other things that I wanted to touch on was something that Alicia brought up a couple of weeks ago and I wanted to bring up as well. It's just kind of knowing just some guidelines on some of the things to either look out for or some of the things to keep in mind when you are looking for a therapist or when you are doing therapy. One of the main, and this is a lot based on what parents told me, and I know that if parents, the amount of things that parents tell me about other places, I'm sure other parents will go to other places and say things about me. So I am pretty sure I'm not exempt from all of these conversations, but it's all right, because I can handle my stories. But anyway, some of the things that parents have told me about their experiences in other places, I just wanted to bring it to your attention so that if it happens to you, you could be mindful that, you know, you have the choice to make your choice. And one of the things is that if you, is that you have to feel comfortable with your therapist, number one. That's the main thing. It has to be a relationship, a back and forth relationship. It doesn't have to be where you message your therapist on a Sunday night, hey girl, how are you going? How was your weekend? What you do? You went to the beach? No. But it does mean that you want to be able to ask your therapist questions. You want to be able to get answers. If you have a problem, you want to feel, you want to know that they will be ready to listen to you. And I mean, even if they can't offer advice, just listen to hear what it is you have to say. So it has to be, you have to have that back and forth relationship where you feel comfortable and you feel trusting. I know that the trust, it takes time sometimes to build up trust with the family and it goes both ways. It takes time 
to build up that relationship sometimes. But if you feel like you're really not getting a vibe that you want to be there, then by all means, you have the right to say, you know what? I think I'm going to go and try another therapist. And as therapists, we cannot get mad at you for that because that's not our place to say you have to stay with me. Now, I know, like, I do have this situation right now where because I am not in my South office or my East office, parents want, don't want to go to another therapist. And it's okay because I'm not going to force anybody because because I understand that I would be the same way too, where if this is what I want, this is what I want. And, you know, you're not willing to compromise and that's okay. It's your child and you need to be happy with who your therapist is. Um, I have heard some instances where they have been, this is for schools too. So for sometimes for schools, I have heard things where you might get charged some ridiculous price or the fees gone up or um, you have to pay in advance for some ridiculous amount of sessions or you're not getting your money back or different or you can't switch therapists, different things like that. Just be mindful of that and just know what you're getting into beforehand. So don't be afraid to ask questions. You can ask your therapist, what are your philosophies? What do you believe in? You can, don't feel, you know, ask them, ask them what they think about certain situations, how they would react. Because again, it's supposed to be a relationship, a back and forth relationship. Now, I will say though that sometimes, depending on how you ask, it might come across like you're not trusting. So one example, some years ago, um, I worked with a child, but I was finding myself having a lot of difficulty dealing with the parent because I didn't feel like she trusted me at all for a long time. And it was really frustrating um, because she wanted me to do something and it wasn't the time for that yet. I didn't feel it was the time to do that yet because uh, we had other things to work on to get to that point of what she wanted. And because she had been to another therapist before, she would tell me what the other therapist will do. And I would kind of say, well, okay, that's what the other therapist wanted to do, but that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something different. And it was a very stressful situation for a long time to the point where I wanted to stop the sessions. Um, and for some reason, it ended up changing completely. And I don't know why, and after I was fine. But looking back on it, both of us were wrong. I was wrong because I didn't listen to what she wanted. And I was thinking, well, yes, I know that what you want is gonna come, but I didn't take the time to sit with her and go through and say, well, this is, the, this is how we could work towards this and kind of show her the steps that we needed to take to get to where she wanted. And then she was also not trusting of me because she came thinking the other therapist did these kind of things. So I was supposed to do those kind of things too. So it is worth and I think a lot of times before, um, I wouldn't have thought to have that back and forth conversation and really listen to parents. But I think now, now hopefully I'm doing a better job of it. Um, so it is important to make sure that you have conversations and to make sure that you know that there is a back and forth. I've also heard too that not that there are times when you might not get feedback from the professional involved with your child. And for some people, it's fine. For some people, if the child is happy and you are happy and you see in progress, and you know, you don't always have that feedback, sometimes it works and it's okay. But other times, if you feel like you're asking your therapist things and you're not getting answers and you want the answers to questions, then you might want to consider, am I okay with staying with this? Or is it something that I feel I need to move on from? And um, 
Kevin is the one, so let me just wrap up this here. Um, you're very welcome. I mean, the experiences here, a lot of them are, I would like it to be based on parents' experiences of what they told me, but I know I have had experiences too of parents thinking all kind of things like asking me if I'm the therapist assistant or secretary and very much being judged on my appearance. But, you know, again, it's about having a conversation and being comfortable. Once you have that conversation and you're comfortable with your therapist, go for it. Right now, we have a lot more OTs and especially having the program that we have here, we have the opportunity where you have choice. So if you're not happy with your therapist, in one spot, you have the you have choice. You could go to you could go and you could shop around before you move your child, so that at least you could feel comfortable. That's the most important thing. All right, now Kevin is on. I just want to introduce Kevin quickly. He is a developmental therapist, which is not the same as a behavioral therapist, from my understanding of the, of what Kevin does. He looks at a child's development and fills in the gaps that might be missing. So he doesn't work with any specific diagnosis, but I know that a lot of his kids have um, are on the autism spectrum. And for me, now I'll be honest, I don't refer any of my kids with behaviors to anybody else but Kevin, just because I have seen his work and we share a lot of the same kids and I see the difference in the children who have these sessions with them. I see how they are able to not just manage themselves, but understand why they just understand their behaviors, understand the interactions between the two of us. And for me, that is a little bit more important than just stopping a behavior because it is a behavior. So let me just find him and spotlight him here. Right, Kevin, you can hear me? Yep, hi, hi everyone. Right, you don't have to turn on your video if you don't wanna turn on your video, but. No matter. All right, so welcome to Thrive, thank you very, very much for being here. I know that you had a kind of a rough day. <laughs> so thanks for taking the time to come and chat with us for today. No problem. Um, I know that some of the questions that we got before were on behavior. So I really wanted you to be here to share your expertise on that because you will be able to answer it best. And one of the, one parent messaged me some time ago and she wanted to find out about puberty. This for older children or preteens. Some of the, obviously, a lot of them will be going through emotions besides what they're dealing with when they have autism and you have to manage yourself and manage your behaviors. So how can parents manage their growing teen or preteen? What are some of the things they could do to help to manage any behaviors that might come up? Um, well, look, it, it really depends on the level of, of that the kid is at, whether they are able to um, cognitively process everything that is going on. So you really have to understand where where they are at in terms of, of if they are on the spectrum. Um, the higher functioning kids, you can have a, a brief conversation with them um, in terms of how they, in terms of building their awareness. Um, the lower functioning kids or the moderate kids, uh, things like social story, um, being able to help. What I also do is using the IDI process, helping them think through me or think through their parents as well to help them better understand themselves and to help them better uh, process and regulate as well. Okay. Hmm. I think the particular parent that was asking me, she was saying that her child, I guess there were a lot of behaviors mm -hmm. in terms of, or just becoming more aggressive. Can you, right. for children who might be a little bit more 
on the aggressive side, even younger mm -hmm. ones as well. Is there anything mm -hmm. in particular that parents could do when a child is being aggressive to kind of quell that situation? Well, there's a variety of things. Some things that you would actually recommend in terms of the deep pressure. Sensory um, things. Sensory things uh, as well would, would help. One of the main things, because the, the ones that are nonverbal, it's difficult to find, to, to kind of uh, pinpoint exactly what the issues might be. You have to literally, unless you know what is triggered, mm -hmm. you have to deal with the behavior itself. And with the behavior itself, my last case, my last last resort is actually um, going in a, in a room that has as minimal stimuli as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. Being able to engage with them with minimal words because I've I've found that the more words or the more you try to 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 talk to them at that point because normally they go from zero to ten in a matter of seconds. Yeah, they, they're not able to process. So what I do is I have them in a room. Um, I engage minimally uh, with them. If they if per chance they might attack um, mm -hmm. or, or come at you. That's where the deep pressure comes in. Uh, that's where having um, uh, something as simple as a pillow to, to help mm -hmm. them get those those squishes. Uh, being able to always let, I always like to let them know that I am there with them still. So I would right. still, I would still go close to them. I would still touch them. I would still let them know um, when you're ready. Because what happens as well, I find is that they are able to, they, as much as they go from zero to ten quickly, they're able to actually, as they they regulate, mm. it, they're able to process, and then you can slowly get back into how to engage with them. But what I do is I I go for a preferred activity of theirs, mm -hmm. um, something I know that they enjoy, and I introduce it for a period of time, for a couple of minutes, uh, and then I go back into quote unquote a normal engagement with them or right. typical engagement with them. So this would work for meltdowns too, like yeah, any yeah. normal kind of meltdowns. Generally, yeah. Uh, from my experience, yes. On uh, um, the to the extremes, when when a kid is in a an environment or a, an uncomfortable situation where it's unfamiliar, um, then that's the extreme where they will the behaviors they go from zero to ten and they stay at ten for a long period of time because, mm -hmm. for example, they if they're coming to see me for the first time. Um, they, I've had kids cry for maybe three, four, five ses sessions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> once Same. Able to, yeah, yeah. Uh, but once the, you're able to push through and you're able to, to help them regulate by using physical or um, cognitive exercises that, that they are, you find out what they're comfortable with, I use that to tr transition into engagement with them. Right. So after the meltdown, so basically you show your support and right. well, there's the added sensory part there to make sure they come down. Right. And then yeah. when they start to regulate, do something that they prefer to do and yeah. then finally so, move it to whatever right. you do. Right. And I, I keep that short as well too, because I don't want it to get into what we call a static behavior mm -hmm. because then they will assume every time they, they have a meltdown, they get that, um, not our reward, but they get that comfort. Um, but we also want them to right. self-soothe and they also want them to self-regulate uh, as well. Okay. Um, while we here and talking about behavior and stuff, it just came in my head, but I want to get your views on stimming. Mm -hmm. And because I know that is one of those hot topic kind of things. And it's one of the things I was asked recently with, um, mm -hmm if it's an important thing or if it's something that should be stopped. Mm. I say um, yes, it's important and it shouldn't be stopped unless it's um, harmful. Or... Right, okay. right. Yeah. Um, I found that once it, it doesn't go to the extreme where you lose them for the entire, uh, an entire period of time, they need that yeah. break. So this, this thing to me is a break. Um, you allow it for a period of time, and then you, you continuously, after a few minutes, you, you redirect. And I found that what, most times, I would say 90% of the times, um, the stimming dissipates, and it's able to, they're able to regain uh, self-focus or engagement with the other person. But 
having them react trying to stop them actually makes it a little bit tougher um because they will want to continue to do it as well yeah and then you might end up having the behavioral part of it coming in right. where it gets it yeah then it, 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 yeah 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 um one of the things that for me sometimes it's hard to kind of gauge is prompting with how mm -hmm. much prompts to use and for me it becomes hard because it's trying to put speech therapy and trying to encourage language and all of that but still be mindful that you don't want to be over prompting right. i tend to <laughs> go with what i learned from you and mm -hmm. my other courses with not given prompts but um what are some of the things you could share with parents in terms of how much to prompt or help children and how much to you know hang back well again the prompts the least you can do it, the better. Um, because what happens is that with the prompts, they get reliant on the prompts. So they, it becomes a crutch for them. Right. And what happens is that, you know, as they get older, they get more and more reliant on the prompts uh, as well. So um, what, and, and you know, I use a lot of more nonverbal communication. Yeah. Um, again, physical touch where, um, for example, if, uh, if we are able to, if we're, we're doing an activity and they are not necessarily 100% engaged with me, I would actually, not even physical touch, but I would go close to them um, mm -hmm. so that they are aware of, of me being in that moment with them. And more often than not, what happens is that they are able to, to get back in the moment with me without me having to, to physically prompt them or cue them as to what would be, um, what would be the next step. There are times when I initially may um, exaggerate my 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 um, actions mm -hmm. with them, but once, but I always keep in mind once I do that, the goal is to to make it as minimal as possible throughout that session so it does not become um, a, 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 a a standard prompt. Right. One of the big things is going out in public. And especially for things like um, children who might have unpredictable behaviors, mm -hmm. how are some of the ways that parents could help to either prep the child or, or some of the things that parents could do if they need to go out in public and need to take your child and don't know, and don't know right. what is going to happen? All right. Um, no, th this is an exercise I... I, I, I suggest to my parents all the time um it's not going out is not something that you do um at that specific moment for that it's something that you prepare right so you do a, a series to me i've recommended you do a series of short outings mm -hmm. to build the, the kid into going for an extended period of time um now that being said there are moments when they might show behavior regardless of they've been very successful with those short outings. So I've actually recommended to parents as well. So for example, if you're going to the grocery, um, you go on a day that you don't really need to go, but it's a practice. So they go for one item, they can act actually use a social story or um, use very minimal words, few words for the, for the family and let them know, uh, for the kids, sorry, and you let them know um we are going to get whatever and then we leave and you do that for a period of time so what happens is that the kids get the kid basically starts to understand the rhythm of what is expected mm -hmm. um they become less anxious um and if there is a behavior you are going for a short period of time so you're able right. to because i also don't like stopping the 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 activity in the in the middle of it because i want them to understand that there's a completion to it also okay because if they get a behavior it doesn't mean that that they leave right away although okay. a lot of parents would want to do that mm -hmm. um which is understandable but also even if it's just going and actually touching the item that you were supposed to get yeah identifying that and then leaving if there is a meltdown mm -hmm. that is another suggestion uh and i found that also going when initially when it's not crowded of course yeah um, it's adjusting to, to to the crowds and the different sensory inputs 
um, also plays a, a part in terms of the adjustment to that and learning. That's interesting. I actually thought that because only because I've seen it in different places before. You know, if your child has a tantrum, feel free to just drop your cart and pick them up and go. I thought no, that that was. Well, to me, well, from my experience, what happens exactly. there, unless it's extreme, if if it's if they have a, a an extreme where they they are self self injuring or they they're doing things that are you're really out of control, yes, that's an extreme. But if they're doing it to the point where it's just they're causing more of a scene than anything else and not really harming themselves or anything anyone right. else, I would just I would complete that activity right. um, that, and then follow through so that they are they they understand more and more uh, what is expected and that they don't think that okay this happens so once I do this I can you know, right I, I away with it. so like every time you go to the store if you don't want to go you could just have a behavior and then you'll get to leave right. without exactly. the activity. yeah yeah okay interesting that's another question Hold on a second. Mm -hmm. At what point, um, so for a parent who might be thinking, maybe I should get a behavior, maybe I should get behaviors looked at. Is it, at what point in the process do you normally come in? Is it for, you know, school age children? What is your, your range of children that you see like? Actually, for, for kids on the spectrum, the earlier the better. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is that, uh, as I mentioned before, they get into static thinking and their brain, basically, it, it gets hardwired into certain behaviors. Right. And the older they get, the harder it is to, to, to learn new behaviors or, or, or learn positive behaviors or, or learn to be able to, be, to, have, a flexible, uh, to have flexible thinking. So the age range would, for me, normally it's from three to, see, I, I can say 30, 35, just because the developmental age wow. of those 30 year olds is not 30. It's actually maybe uh, 10 to 15, half that, okay. so half of that. Okay. Would you see somebody less than three? Or is um, that just a time when... Less than it three. Work too much I, with behaviors. Um, less than I think three is my cutoff, just because mm -hmm. before three is a little bit more. Um, there's still the difference of um, being able to understand what is their their it's it's their developmental age as opposed to behavior. Right. I think this question came already with throwing and and pelts and things. I know for some, like my nephew, he had a phase where when he was maybe about two and a half or something where he would just throw everything, hit all of that. Um, mm -hmm. But I know for some to run, if you throw any pelts in. Yeah. Uh, and how someone who's four, who's four and, and throwing and pelting a lot, that's the question. I'm not sure if that question was related to that one okay um, um throwing and pelting okay four year old oh, who's throwing okay. and pelting. yeah um that is tough uh it's a habit uh, that they've developed uh and then once you give a reaction what happens is that i'm i'm, I'm probably sure that they do it more once you react or you tell them no not to do it uh, uh so what i do is I, I minimize, you have to do it in a way that is more or less in a, in a, conf, a, a space that has minimal throwing stuff initially. Right. I mean, they, they're going to be, ex, they're going to be exposed to, to normal everyday things where they, they will throw, mm -hmm. but you have to, you have to put them in, in situations where there is minimal throwing um, uh, miss, missiles. At that uh, particular point in time, and while in there, then they ban doors. Um, then I, you have to redirect, 
and they're four years old. So I think for that, there is you have to physically redirect them with, with preferred activities or activities that would would get them away from what they're doing. Now, part of that, that the banging of the doors is because they can't throw, of course. Mm -hmm. But you also want them to, to have different, and they might be, and, and Alia, you could, you could, uh, you could recommend, you could tell me, see, suggest, just let me just read this. Boom, yeah, that's a good question. It's for the parent, do the same. Um, in my experience, uh, that because I've seen videos with that too, where right. you know, the child crying and the dad crying like the child, and, and then yeah. the child stops. Yeah, but in my experience, you want them. Office. What's that? I don't know if that would work with our clients. Yeah, yeah. It in my experience, it is difficult to do that just because um, you don't. They see you, but I, I'm not sure if they're actually processing what is going on. Mm -hmm. They just, you, you shock them and, and, and they stop. But being able to, to self-regulate, you, um, that understanding is, is, is not there. So then that means that every time the kid has a meltdown or they do that, you have to, to do that. Right. Because I, ha I haven't found in my experience um, that to, to be dissipated because they seen the parent do it. An example would be if they're having a meltdown in the mall or at a family function, does the parent act like that for them in that situation? Right. It's, it's, it, it works, but it's, to me, it's a quick fix. It works because of the shock factor, right. but not any long term in terms of understanding right. why you do that. Right. Um, right. And, and, and that's where we work on communication a little bit more as well, where they are able to, even even if they're nonverbal, to be able to 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 use through gestures or through the, the nonverbal uh, communication to help appease themselves by making choices, um, by being able to, if as a parent you would understand them better, um, you would understand them better by being but you know what works and what doesn't work. Sorry, I'm just reading some stuff there uh, as um, well. But while you're reading it, one of the things with the banging doors and the pelts and everything, mm -hmm. part of that for me, if a child is, you know, slamming the door hard or pelts and everything, part of me for that will wonder if it might be a sensory thing where they need to yeah. get that input. And yeah. it might be, instead of throwing something randomly or banging doors to do something physical so that they get a little bit more right. movement. Right. But then it's yeah. how, how, well, I guess for me, I would try the, the physical part and then if it's still continuing, then the behavioral part comes yeah. in because yeah. you don't really know which one it is. Yeah. Unless yeah. they figure out why it is they're doing it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because some of it is sensory in terms of of them hearing that that as well too exactly the sensation of hearing that that specific echo or mm -hmm. that specific sound as well so redirecting them giving them a, a different out input um would help also mm -hmm. so again i'll go back to just trying to understand why it is they're doing yeah. what they're doing so if it right. is a behavior if they're trying to get a reaction out of you if they're trying to get a sensory need or right. if they're trying to communicate something Mm -hmm. was the was the background behind it yeah and that's why i think i always say that parents know their kids best um so they know certain things for the most part mm -hmm. um that would trigger so it's, it's being able to understand what works best or being able to, to explain to the therapist as well too well you know i found that this kind of happens more when and then what happens is that right. they were able to build a case for the kid and know yeah. how to, to deal with that to, to, specific situation. One of the things that um, I want to ask so that came up at some point, and I guess the question here with the eight-year-old doing everything that a four-year-old is doing, is that if you have an older child who might be mimicking some of the behaviors of the younger child, or a lot of times parents will say their child who 
is in a special school might be mimicking some of the right. behaviors of other children and yeah. concerned about it. Is it mm -hmm. something to be worried about or something to ignore or redirect? Um, it, there should be some concern because they're picking up behaviors that are not, they, they should not, or they did not have. Um, <laughs> sorry, these <laughs> distract me. Other kids. He, he seems to really want friends and he does not, he does better Aww. with all the friends. But kids. Yeah, um, for that, any advice on how to deal with the meltdowns without keeping him isolated? Well, the first thing I think um, the meltdowns are possibly, but you also want to find the root of, of, of the situation. So he is with us, he's probably with the kids and he's trying to engage and he's frustrated because he cannot engage with the kids. And what happens is that the behaviors are, are displayed. So what I think, um, and it, it goes also to the part of the school as well too, where they have to facilitate that, the engagement a little bit more with, with the kid with special needs and the typical children. What I've recommended to some families also is for them to, uh, the teachers find or uh, target two or three kids who are more patient, more, um, who would like to engage with the kid and they, they facilitate uh, engagement with them for periods of time. Not for the entire time, but for periods right. of time uh, so that they're able to, to, to show. And, and then even during those engagements, what happens is that because the kid with special needs might be so excited, they might show behavior with this kid because, not because they, they, they're trying to be, they have a, a, it's a meltdown or anything, but they don't know how else to engage. Right. So that's where it comes in and they facilitate um, engagement with, with the both, with two or three of the kids that they're able to understand that. And even if putting it on a schedule as well too, so that um, Tammy who has special needs, um, Tammy, who has special needs, he is going to play with Jim and and Teddy uh, mm -hmm. after break, you know, and, and so that because what happens as well too is if you place them into a group right away, and they want to engage but they get so anxious, they those behaviors come out as well. So it's a, a different, it's a, a variety of things that that can trigger, mm -hmm. but I think the best thing is to, to facilitate engagement with the other kids. Um, with a small number of kids for periods of time. I was just going to say that and maybe you could start not with a group of kids, but just, you know, like one. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, some, somebody. Yeah. Close. Well, I would, I or would, maybe yeah. Not family. yeah, not family. I would prefer, um, not family because it's too familiar as okay. well. Okay. Mine is this not And also in social situations, because um, because it they could be overly anxious in these situations, they could be sensory overload. Um, yeah, all those things you have to kind of take into consideration. So, if when you say social situations, to whoever this is for, um, is it if it's by fam family uh, another family member, or is it in the mall? Is it you know? depending on, on that situation as well too, or is he better behaved at a small gathering? Um, is he better behaved in a small store where there's minimal um, potential anxiety starting um, events? Right. As you said that, and you talk about family garden and, and, and that kind of thing, um, one of the things that I would like to ask you about too is for a lot of people, because I know you work a lot with the families and the wider circle, not just the child. Um, mm -hmm. For a lot of people within the family unit, how important is it that the family is on the same page with what is happening and what's going on, especially with both parents? Do they need to all be on the same page? Or if, if like, if let's say, Mommy is the one who's interacting most with the child. I mean, dad yes. is on board, but not mm -hmm. as involved. How yeah. could they, how could they 
managed so that the child is able to get the same consistency everywhere. Right. Um, what I, I suggest is the parents as well too is that they change rules at times. Okay. Because they, they see specific, the kids have specific perceptions of, or of learned behaviors with each parent. So sometimes one parent has gets the, the, the more softer, angelic right. behavior, yeah. while the other one doesn't, because the other one is more of the disciplinary and the other one is the one who, who kind of forces the, 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 the academic or the, yeah. the, the therapy part of it. Um, so it's being able for each parent or, or whoever is in the family setting who is close to the kid to switch roles and for that, the, uh, each person to teach the other person um, how they engage by showing them how they engage and practicing um, those things in simple activities that you would do at home. Simple, um, really functional activities. You don't, you don't need to, to make up a therapy um, session to have, yeah. it, to have learned engagement. So it doesn't have to be that one is a good cop, bad cop. No, no. That <laughs> means it, you have to switch it each time as well too because yeah. what happens is that the kid will have, sometimes they have behaviors um, for no reason but that the parent is, they perceive that parent to be um, the disciplinarian. Ah, uh, okay. That's, that's very important. And it's good yeah. to know that. Um, with the thing here about the preschool and with the son being ostracized in preschool, I think a lot of that too comes down to the school. Yeah. Like the responsibility has to be on school to educate all the students and it doesn't have to be just where the child with the special needs has to be the one isolated. Everybody yeah. should have a part to play yes. and make yeah. it sure that that child is comfortable and make yes. it sure that everybody knows how to manage and, and not to ostracize the child just because of a century meltdown, but instead know how to help the child. The same as right. you were just saying, right. like having the right. buddy system and then. Right. Yeah, because, and, and also it's, and unfortunately, because I have some parents as well too who have said, you know, in the school, the, the, the school does minimal to help them um, mm -hmm. with their kid. They, they accept the kid in the school, they, they take them in, but in terms of how they can, they can better the situation for themselves as well as the kid, that may, that kind of, that support is not there. Um, yeah. So, what I try and do when I can is I go into schools and some schools are receptive, some schools say they are, but yeah. they, you know, uh, it, it's not as supportive. Um, but it, I think the school, because besides home, the school is the next main uh, engagement of the kid. And right. if they're willing to, to adjust a little bit, um, it would make a big difference, not just for that kid, but for other kids who might potentially come into that school. Mm -hmm. uh, as well. And well, it will help the students who don't have special needs, it will help them in any situation oh, yeah. they go into where they encounter somebody else. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. They'll know what to do. Exactly. If um, um, everybody just look at the chat for a little bit, there's somebody who is offering to do play dates and that kind of thing. So if you want to, you could just take down the contact number and keep in contact. That's a nice gesture. Right. And then even when they have play dates, they, they need also to have uh, an understanding going into it uh, of certain um, boundaries mm -hmm. in terms of, of physical boundaries and in, in terms of, of how the kid and their kids engage as well too, um, so that the kids are able to engage, but not, um, not in a negative way. Right. Yeah, because they don't want to have the play dates and then they get frustrated or maybe right. somebody lash out at somebody else. That kind of right. Thing. And also the parents shouldn't hover, but they should, they, they know before the parents even meet, they should uh, have a discussion as to these are the characteristics of my kid. Right. Um, these are the things that I do um, to help when he might get anxious or have a meltdown and, and, and the other parent would reciprocate and they're able to know, they would be able to better be, they would be familiar with, with how to engage uh, and what to expect. 
So they prep for the play date will actually start right. with the parents having their right. conversation first, go through everything, blah, 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 right. and then right. kind of go from there. Yeah. Interesting. If, it, if that play date does happen, please let us know eventually how it went and what kind of things were put in place. All right. Well, Kevin, thank you very, very, very much for being here today. No uh, problem. If anybody else has any questions, feel free to send a message and let us know and I'll pass it on to Kevin to get it answered. Okay. The, the recording is on YouTube, the one from last week too. I just couldn't email everybody to send it out because um, I don't have the addresses. Zoom is not giving it to me anymore. But it's on YouTube. This will be on YouTube too, on Google Kids YouTube page, so you can check it out. Thank you very much for being here, everybody. Thank you, Kevin, for being here. Um, no you can go and relax now and enjoy your weekend. <laughs> okay. All right. All Thank right. you, everybody. Bye, everyone. See you all next week.